Hey, what's going on, everybody? Listen, I want to welcome you to this particular session of Prosper 21, Hustle and Flow. This is going to be a phenomenal, I want to say groundbreaking, only because we're doing it and because we have such an amazing guest um, that I'm going to be interviewing who's going to be sharing with us. Um, this is a woman with a very profound story, but more than her past being profound and um, powerful, I really believe that what God is doing in her life and where she is heading and what she is doing, I think is 10 times more profound. Um, you know, the Bible says this, that eyes haven't seen, ears haven't heard, neither has it entered into the heart of uh, men, what God has prepared for those who love him. And I'm telling you this, that um, when we finish this session today with this woman of God, you are going to really just see how much is possible and you're going to be inspired and encouraged on how you can take your cause your passion your mission that you have even if it's not a, a traditional commercial enterprise or business or it's like selling cookies or whatever but you'll be able to take that and you'll be able to see how you can turn it into something that is going to be beneficial for you and how it can be beneficial for the kingdom of God. I'm telling you that you're gonna you're gonna love this. All right. So, without further ado, I want to introduce. Uh, I feel like David Letterman, my special guest coming to the stage, <laughs> the one and only Becca Charleston. Becca, how are you doing? <laughs> I am doing well. How are you today, Pastor? I am phenomenal. I, I've I've literally been so excited to do this, and I, I just I'm so grateful that you're here. This is going to be a blessing, and I know that you're going to drop some amazing gems uh, for people who are connected and listen to this today and are part of our workshop. So I'm going to get out your way. Uh, you know, just tell us your story. Tell us, you know, who who is Becca Charleston and, and what God has brought you through and, and what God is doing in your life right now. And God has done some amazing things in my life. Honestly, there was a, a point in my my life that I never thought I would live to see 21 with what I was experiencing, what was happening and to now be, you know, sitting here today in the state of Texas. I just turned 40 recently. I'm a mom. I live a completely different life, but I, I went through a lot of hard stuff and I, I kind of joke with the Lord and like, okay, God, I get it. I can handle a lot. You know, he, he obviously promises that he'll only give us what we can handle and he'll always provide a way out. And, and it's so true. I think just for a long time, I didn't look to God. You know, I looked to men, you know, to protect me and to try to save me. And, it got me in some terrible situations, but I actually grew up here in Texas, um, the youngest of six kids. My parents have been married, I think, 57 years at this point. I uh, grew up going to church, um, but I knew a very rules-based God. I went to a Southern Baptist church, and it was I, I truly thought that if I wasn't living the right way, then God didn't want to hear from me. And probably the first time I realized my family's life wasn't like everyone else's was I was five years old and my oldest brother committed suicide. And obviously that was a really hard moment in my family's life. It's the only time my parents almost got divorced and um, they tried to recover the best they could, which my mom said she gave it to God, which meant she just prayed about it and didn't talk about it. And my dad said he had five other mouths to feed and he had to go right back to work. And um, I found out later and my dad didn't even speak my brother Brian's name for the next two years out of his mouth. And so it just became this issue that we didn't talk about. You know, we just swept it under the rug and we kept it moving. Like we would show up, you know, put on our pretty dress for Sunday school and church on Sunday. And, um, you know, when people ask us how we're doing, we plaster a smile on our face and say that we're fine. And so looking back, what I realized, what that taught me was that we don't talk about important issues in our household. And, you know, the problem, though, with those rules based, right, authoritarian based households is there's no authentic relationship. And I I had a mostly normal childhood from that point. I um, was a soccer player. I was a cheerleader. I was a very popular kid. Um, and I, I, I had um, a couple of big incidents happen. I, I wound up getting bullied pretty bad in the fifth grade and got sexually assaulted um, for the first time that year as well slept over at my best friend's house and her older brother had a sleepover as well. And, um, I, I was still a good kid, you know, still, still, still plugging into my church community. And at the age of 14, I wound up getting raped at a church lock-in. And I think that was a huge pivotal moment, um, in my childhood. And 
within about a year from that time, I, I never told anyone about those experiences, mind you, because I, I thought I would get in trouble. I thought I had done something to contribute to those experiences. And while I knew that shouldn't have happened, I still, like a child, kept my mouth closed because I didn't have those authentic relationships, you know, those real raw conversations. And so um, I, I just started using drugs. I wanted to be numb. You know, I didn't uh, want to live the life I was living and just wanted to zone out. And um, I wound up moving out of my parents' house at the age of 16. They said, fine. And uh, it had a, a series of significant events happen. They they tried to save me by signing over their rights of me and placing me in an institution in East Texas because they, they suspected I was using drugs. I was dropping out of high school due to lack of attendance. And they were terrified. They had no idea what to do. And so they placed me in this institution. And to me, it was the ultimate form of betrayal and abandonment and rejection. I, I couldn't see that they were only doing what they thought. They, did, they didn't know how to help me. And they thought maybe these people would. Um, but that's not how my 16-year-old brain saw it. And so I made a vow to do whatever I could and run and never look back. And that's exactly what I did at the six month mark, I had a home visit for good behavior and literally broke the blinds on my way out of the window on my last night at my family's house. And I never looked back to me. My family was dead to me. I just started living with whoever I could. I was uh, obviously homeless at this point. We stole food in order to eat every day. I couldn't get a job as a high school dropout. Um, and I just bounced around from one terrible situation to another. I think the enemy, when when you feel really broken, the enemy is so good at whispering in your ear that only other broken people are going to accept you. And so I ran to other really broken people because that's who I felt like I identified with. And I wasn't long before I met this cute guy that seemed like he was going to be my boyfriend. And I had no idea what intentions he truly had for me and until the second night at his apartment. And um, I was forced into a, a world of prostitution on um, that blade or the track, a known area of prostitution in Dallas, Texas, on Harry Hines Boulevard. And it was like my entire world flipped upside down on top of me. You know, I of course I thought about running, but Harry Hines is a scary place today in 2021 in the middle of the daytime, it, much less in 1999 to a little girl that should have been, you know, picking out a mom for homecoming, right? I should have been entering my sophomore year of high school. And here I was being forced with literally life or death is what it felt like. I felt like if I run, I'm going to get raped and murdered. And so I did what they told me to do. And um, that one day turned into the next 10 years of my life. Uh, at one point, I thought I was getting away, but I ran into the arms of another man who would turn around and abuse me and exploit me all over the country. And, you know, I mean, after that first day, that first act, the amount of shame, you know, that you feel, I felt like. How would I, like I said earlier, I mean, I, I didn't think I would live to see 21. Um, I, I felt like I could never be normal again. I mean, the enemy was just constantly telling me these lies as well as my traffickers, you know, reinforcing that I was worthless and my only value was what someone was willing to pay me for my body. And um, for me, finally getting away, I wound up, uh, it, it wasn't until the federal authorities became involved, I wound up serving 13 months in federal prison because I was too scared to tell my trafficker because I believed him. You know, when someone beats you or you have blood pouring out of your face, you believe them when they say that they'll kill you. And so I kept my mouth shut and I served my time and was able to escape from him in 2009. And I wish life got better then, but it didn't. Um, I really, I'd been arrested 10 times by that point, had a federal felony. I had no job experience. I only got my GED because a federal prison made me. Um, so no education. I, you know, he, by trafficker, put a, literally a million dollars of debt in my name. I had a $600,000 foreclosed home, two $80,000 cars that got repossessed in my name. He had put, our trafficker knew how to evade detection. And so he knew to put things in the victim's names. And so um, I, I really didn't feel like I had any options. And so I stayed in the life and I, I kind of floundered and went through one dysfunctional relationship after another and eventually found my way to a little bit of a healthier place. And about a year into that relationship is I found out I was pregnant. And that for me changed everything because while I didn't have compassion on myself, um, I did have compassion on that little baby growing inside me. And so I called my family in Texas and said, you know, I'm, I'm pregnant. I don't want to raise a baby in this environment. Will you help me? And, and so I'm 30 years old and moved back to Texas Moved back into my mom and dad's house to start over from not even from scratch, from less than scratch. If you think about all the debt and all the things that I had going against me, but but I knew I had to try something different. And um, 
I mean, I, I literally went to church uh, like about two hours. I drove 16 hours straight through from Las Vegas to Dallas. And I, I went to church about two hours. I took a little two hour nap. I was almost four months pregnant by that point on January 7th of 2012. And uh, my sister came in the house and she was like, hey, I'm gonna go to church. Do you wanna go with me? And I just remember hopping up with this hopeful expectancy. You know, I I started like having this burden to pray once I got pregnant. And, you know, like I said, I grew up with that angry rules-based God. I didn't know the God that was passionately pursuing a relationship with me, you know, that it was just, he was just waiting for me to turn to him, you know? And so I went to church and obviously nothing has been the same since. Um, I, I was wrapped with arms of people that didn't know me, but that wanted to be the hands and feet of Jesus, right? They didn't want to read a book to me. They didn't want to read the Bible and quote Bible verses to me. They wanted to be love me with action, right? I wound up getting so many different services I received from my church. I'm still a member at Gateway Church in South Lake. And um, I, I just okay, was introduced. Boys. Yes. Uh -huh. Amen. Come on. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah, it's been it's been a wild, crazy ride. I know we're going to um, talk about kind of some of the stuff I'm doing today. But, yeah, I mean, I never I never thought I'd make it out. I never thought that I could have a future that didn't revolve around my body being sold, to be honest. Wow. 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 That's just so amazing. Rebecca. I mean, it's. It's a tremendous story, and it's, I mean, it's, I mean, you put, you know, decades in, in five minutes, but it's just so much, and uh, it's just a beautiful thing to see and to hear just that story of just your turnaround and, and what God has done for you and how you were able to, you know, um, to get out of something that, like you said, that you didn't even see yourself getting out of. That's that's mm -hmm. just amazing. That's just amazing. Now, I know we're, we're, we're this is a, interview that's more geared around our you know from an economic perspective and increase in abundance but I want to just kind of just tap in a little bit you said some very profound things um, uh, number one you mentioned how you had when you were 14 you were sexually assaulted at church and um, previously to that that you had your first sexual assault um, before that um, you know how, how did did that impact your God perspective particularly getting raped mm -hmm. at church at a, a at a shut-in i mean I, I can't you know that seems so weird to me to hear it's just like man that how did that impact you it it impacted me in ways that i didn't even understand until i was 30 to be honest like wow. those memories that i had i was actually uh living back in Texas and going to a, I'm not sure if you've ever heard the curriculum, Mending the Soul. It's an amazing uh, faith-based workbook about abuse. And it wasn't until I was going through that workbook within a small group that I even remember those experiences. Like I had suppressed them and I had internalized those messages at not so much at God, um, but at my femininity and at um, how men are going to treat me, that men are going to take whatever they want from me. And so it didn't matter whether I wanted it or not. Those are the messages, you know, that, that I began to receive that, you know, that my only value was what some man wanted out of me, which you can see that played so well into ultimately being vulnerable to being trafficked. That's, that, that's, that's, that's so true. And that's powerful. That's powerful. When now, I want to talk about just just a pause on, on on sex trafficking because it's something that's near and dear to my heart and I'm becoming more and more aware of it and and I'm really trying to help our church and our movement figure out how we can help and and really um, become a positive asset to uh, to that cause how you mentioned something that just seems so contrary to people who are who've never been involved in you said that you tried to get away but you you didn't because you thought that what they said they were going to do, they were going to do in terms of killing you and, and you know, really harming you. And for people who aren't, who've never experienced that, been a victim of it, first thing they say is, well, why don't you just get away? Why don't you just run away? And I know that's one of, tell, why is that one of the most foolish things that people can say um, about, you know, victims of, of, of trafficking? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it just it just really goes uh, against what we know about brain science and neurobiology. I get to do presentations today 
with Dr. Chris Wilson on the neurobiology of trafficking, how coercion can feel like choice. And, you know, it, it's it's very similar to, honestly, to domestic violence. You know, we there's millions of women across the world that are stuck in violent relationships. And it's so easy from the outside to look and go, why don't you just leave? Like, obviously, you're okay with that because you left them once and you went back. Or, you know, the national average for domestic violence and human trafficking that it takes a woman to leave or a person to leave is seven times, seven times. That's the average. So sometimes it takes three. It took me three escape attempts for it to finally work. Sometimes it's 15 or 20, you know, and we have no idea, you know, which when we encounter the victims, um, you know, if they're if this is the time that they're going to get out when we try to help them. But there's a lot of reasons for that. I mean, a lot of people, we talk about trauma bonds and Stockholm syndrome. And while that is obviously factual, but there's also real attachments that my trafficker uh, made with me in the beginning of the relationship and that grooming process where I began to view him as a dolphin. He was a safe guy. He wanted to help me. He wanted to get me clean off drugs. You know, my second trafficker did. Um, he wanted me to start working out. He wanted all these things that it felt like he loved me. You know, it felt like he really cared about me and he wanted me to be a better person. In reality, what all he was doing was making me the most profitable he could. But I didn't know that to my 17 year old brain. I attached in a real way to this 37 year old man, you know, this much older man that was completely manipulating me. And even when I did face violence from him, um, the dynamic, how that plays out is that obviously a trafficker is really a shark, right? But, but I have attached the trafficker as a dolphin, you know, to use an analogy. And even when he acts like a shark, I think it's my fault, right? Because, and I do whatever I can because it, it really causes cognitive dissonance, right? Like we can go like for days on this stuff. I, I kind of geek out on this stuff. I love it. But it's so much easier to default back to the, the more comfortable idea that no, he's a dolphin. Like, no, he, he loves me. Like if I just didn't do that, then he wouldn't have hurt me. And so you internalize the behavior as though it's your fault when in reality, I could never do everything right, right? He would just find new things to beat me for and to use as control. That's so powerful. That's so powerful. Um, and I and I definitely want to have you and 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 really embrace the the world of trafficking and exp and help expose the church to it more and see how we can help. And so I don't want to isolate this and this our time to, today. Um, but but tell us this: how how can if we see someone? I mean, what are some things? Because sometimes I walk through the streets. And I'll see something and I'm just like, I wonder if this woman is a victim, you know, mm -hmm. if she's caught up. And it's like, what can I do? It's like, ah, I want to, you know, ask or I want to, if somebody needs help, it's like, what can we do? How can we best help as not to endanger um, mm -hmm. that person, but at the same time to help, you know, lower that gap of seven times that it takes to for them to get, you know, to escape. Like, what can we do or some practical things? So um, number one, educate yourself. You know, you there's so much resources available online. If you, you just Google red flags of human trafficking, um, you know, and obviously make sure you're at a, on a reputable website, but there there's, there's a plethora of information out there. So number one, educate yourself. And number two, if you do see something like that, Jot down some notes, you know, of if there's a vehicle, what's the license plate number, you know, jot down what it is that made that situation stand out to you as a, a potential human trafficking situation and then make a report. I would say to, to not ever intervene. Um, oftentimes victims are, you know, forced to work on the street and prostitution and the traffickers aren't very far away. And if they look like they're trying to get help from someone or they're wasting time and not working like they're supposed to be, um, that could put the victim in harm's way. And so we don't want to cause a beating, obviously. We want to help. We don't want to cause more harm. And so the best way to do that would be to take notes, you know, definitely note exactly what seemed like a red flag and then make a report to either your local human trafficking task force or the national human trafficking hotline. Excellent. Uh, that's very powerful. 
Um, and my last question that I wanted to ask you uh, pertaining to um, um, trafficking. Uh, now, I, got, I, I came, I would say I was made aware of you and, and you, the brilliant work that you're doing, the amazing work that you're doing. Um, when I was looking up the, the controversy surrounding decriminal, decriminalization of, of sex work, and um, I just kept seeing your name and, um, you know, and you were an advocate and how you were just really involved in the case and specifically for things pertaining to here in New York. And so can you talk to us just very briefly, um, you know, about that whole angle? I know that's a that's a world, you know, it's a Pandora's box. But, um, you know, what exactly do you feel have you been your experience? Cause I know you mentioned that um, you were doing some things to try to, um, you know, end uh, of course, sex trafficking and whatnot. So as far as legally, you know, I think you're doing some things in Nevada. Um, mm -hmm. You were mentioning that. So talk to us about kind of that process and, and the best way to go. And, and is decriminalization a good thing or is it counterproductive? Because for the outside looking in, it may feel, it seems counterproductive. Um, mm -hmm. Again, because we don't know the world or what, it, you know, exactly the mindsets behind it. So can you speak to that? Definitely. So... Um, what we know about research on prostituted people, whether they're there by force or circumstance, it doesn't matter, but what research indicates that the overwhelming majority, 95 plus percent of them have been sexually abused as children. They come from the foster care system, uh, poverty, homelessness, right? Have abusive backgrounds, um, in the, in the home and, um, then we know the average age of entry into prostitution studies show anywhere from 12 to 17 years old. It depends on what study you're looking at. So um, the average age of entry is as a child, which we know even if there isn't a pimp or a trafficker present um, as a child, we know that's a victim of human trafficking. Um, and so you don't just magically get out when you turn 18 though. You know what I mean? Like once you start getting criminalized and arrested for prostitution or soliciting, um, your your odds of ever getting out and having a future that doesn't revolve around that are greatly diminished. And so I think a lot of people have this idea that somehow if you legalize it, then it makes it safer and healthier. And I was actually trafficked through the only legal system of prostitution in Nevada through the brothels there. And so I know exactly my traffic, our trafficker would send us there as a form of punishment. If we weren't making enough money or if we were getting arrested too much, he would send us there so that pimp could control us and we would be forced to work. Um, the treatment that you get in legalized prostitution is horrendous. I had to sleep in the same bed I serviced customers in. I was not allowed to leave the premises. I had to work constant overtime. You're, you all, every time the bell rings, every, every girl has to run up to the front and be there uh, there's listening devices in the room and they're making sure that you're not stealing money. And also if you keep burning down customers, then they're going to kick you out, which means you're going to lose your job. So at the end of the day, like if I, if, if I don't have sleep with you or give you sexual services, if I can't feed my kids, like where's choice in that, right? I, I honestly believe that when you introduce an influencer as powerful as money, choice goes out the window, right? Because at the end of the day, if I can't feed my kids or pay my rent, if I don't um, you know, have a sexual encounter with you, that's, that's not really choice. And so um, right now in America, there's actually, I think seven different states that are trying to go full decriminalization, which is essentially legalization. And um, those of us survivors in the movement, there's hundreds like myself that are um, now leaders. We run nonprofits, you know, we're, we're doing everything we can to help change the laws because what happens, I mean, just look at Nevada, for example. Nevada has a legal market. In reality, it's only seven counties that have about 21 brothels. That's the only place that prostitution is legal in Nevada. But as we all know, if you've ever been to Las Vegas, everyone thinks it's legal in Vegas. And so with that kind of case study, if you will, what we see demonstrated is that a legal market only increases the demand, right? Because the number one deterrent for men that uh, have been studied say that they don't buy sex because they're afraid of getting caught. And so if we take away that deterrent, then a lot more men are going to be willing to buy sex, which is going to create a, a demand, right? Like, like we see in Las Vegas. And so there's never going to be enough willing women to work in prostitution to meet that demand. And that's where traffickers 
brothel owners, owners come in and, and provide that illegal supply to meet that increased demand. And so we know um, as survivors that have been through the movement, whether we were there, like I said, by force or circumstance, it didn't matter um, that uh, uh, full decriminalization is only going to lead to more abuse, right? It's only going to lead to, you know, less cases of trafficking being exposed. Um, it's only going to lead to, you know, worse treatment of women and children, right? Sure. And and these are already people from horrific backgrounds. And so um, what we believe, what we do believe in is the equality model. And so anybody that's interested, you can go to the equality model, us.org. And it's a website that explains what the equality model is. And the equality model is where we decriminalize the people being sold in prostitution. So like myself, I wouldn't have been arrested 10 times, but we criminalize the men that are creating the demand for commercial sex by purchasing women's bodies. And we continue to go after the brothels, the pimps, right? The brothel owners and the other bad actors. But so it's basically partial decrim, but in order to reduce confusion between full decrim and partial decrim, we kind of have rebranded it to be the equality model. Because at the end of the day, every human being has dignity and value and worth, and nobody deserves to live um, the miserable existence that prostitution provides. Wow, this is amazing um, on every level. Thank you so much. This is just uh, truly inspiring and, and enlightening. And, and thank you for sharing this, by the way. Um, so let's turn the corner. And um, like I said, we're going to hopefully have multiple opportunities to help, you know, be a part and really to get deeper into, um, you know, um, uh, trafficking and, and victims and survivors and whatnot. But you said something that I think was a wonderful segue for us as far as life after. Once you get out, um, limited choices, you particularly for you, you didn't you, didn't, you had a GD. Um, mm -hmm. but that only came through prison yep. um, mm -hmm. and you were loaded with massive debt over a million dollars worth of debt you said and I'm assuming that's a, a very similar experience for other um, survivors um, so what is it like for people to when they get out and how did you you know get ahead and um, be able to turn your life around into these amazing things that we're going to be talking about very shortly like what was what was the step for you I mean, it took, it was honestly a lot of hard days, you know, physical freedom doesn't equal emotional or mental freedom. And so even though I was physically free, I was out of trafficking, I was starting my life over with my family, I was very much still trapped mentally. And I still had all those negative, all that negative self-talk after obviously a decade of abuse and exploitation, you know, the, that verbal abuse, that emotional abuse doesn't just magically disappear, right? Like bruises go away, bruises heal, broken bones heal. But those those other things can linger in your mind for a long time. And so honestly, it was God. I mean, it was all God. If I hadn't gone to church, right? And I, I was wrapped around by this community of people, even though I didn't initially identify as a trafficking victim. I mean, honestly, that's the number one challenge for victims is that we don't self-identify as victims. We truly believe that we made bad choices and that we got what we deserved. It's much easier to live in that place of self-blame than it is to admit that someone else controlled you and manipulated you and made you do unspeakable things. Um, that's a very hard thing. And so I, I surfaced as needing help as a single mom in church, and I thought I would be shunned. And instead, um, I heard all about Embrace Grace, which is an amazing program. They're in 500 churches across the country, uh, more than that. And uh, it's a, a program for single moms. And so here I, I got to go to a semester of classes. I got to learn, have more encounters with Jesus. Um, they wound up, they threw like a big, huge baby shower for you. So I got everything I needed for my baby. The church gave me a car. I didn't have a car. I couldn't buy a car, obviously, with my credit at that point. Um, I wound up getting in a grant program at my church where they helped cover 75% of my bills while I went to school as a single mom. Like, those wow. things were huge. I mean, when I say they were the hands and feet of Jesus, like legitimately providing resources, you know, and not just like, I'm going to pray for you, but like, hey, how can I walk alongside you? Let me let me feel you spiritually as well as let me provide like in the, in the real world your what needs you have. And so that was huge. I mean, 
it was a community of people that came around. Valiant Hearts was one of the first programs I ever went to to for healing from the exploitation. And um, I wound up uh, going through their program in 2012. I graduated in 2013 from their program. And in 2017, I actually came back on as their executive director, which like, I mean, only God could write that. Like I never, I never thought that, um, that I would have a future, right? I never thought that, I thought all those things were gonna always hold me back, but I just kept pushing, you know? And honestly, for me, um, I mean, having my son, I named him Isaiah. I researched like all the different prophets in the Bible and wanted to give him, obviously my name, the way it's spelled is a biblical name and wanted to carry on that tradition. But I mean, he was my little Superman. I mean, it was for him that I was willing to change everything and giving up was no longer an option because I didn't want a day of my son's future to look anything like my past. And so even those hard days where, I mean, I have obviously experiencing complex compounded trauma for a decade of PTSD. Um, and some days are hard, you know, I'll be getting, when I was going back to school and getting my undergrad degree, I wound up graduating summa cum laude with my bachelor's degree in criminal justice and earned my master's degree in criminology in 2018. But, you know, during the, that eight years in school that I didn't even know if I could complete one course. And, you know, I would, you'll have days where you just can't stop crying and you don't even know why you're crying. And um, definitely therapy has played a huge part, you know, um, in, in helping me process the trauma and, you know, be able to create new healthy thinking patterns and behavior patterns, obviously, as well. Um, because, you know, honestly, I, I, one of the coolest words I got, Pastor, after I spoke was this woman came up to me and she said, wow, you went through the fire and came out not smelling like smoke. And I mean, that's just the Lord. You know, it just, it was God. It was, it was fully submitting to God and letting him rewrite the story, you know, letting him speak to those broken pieces, letting him be the one to tell me like, baby girl, like you were running to those men for protection but I was the one protecting you the whole time. And I was just waiting for you to look at me. And, and I know God saved me through that process because what I get to do with my life today, I mean, I'm in front of probably five to 10,000 people a year, um, not only sharing my story, but training law enforcement on how to better interact with victims. I um, testify before Congress. I helped get a, a law passed in Texas. Now, the first time a man gets caught purchasing sex, it's a state jail felony, um, which is a, a huge push towards that equality model I mentioned. But I'm also lobbying in Congress um, at the federal level to get a law passed that would provide federal vacature for victims like myself that have federal felonies because of our trafficking experience. And because I'm not the only one, there's there's a lot of us. And so, I mean, just the stuff that I get to do today um, because of what I went through, you know, and sure. and that's it's like being able to let God use those really hard pieces, those really broken, ugly pieces that maybe for some people they can just walk away and never look at it again and sweep it under the rug like my parents did. Um, but for me, allowing God to use it has been the biggest blessing of all. That is uh, tremendous. And uh, it's just amazing. And I think you, you said something so profound. You said letting God use those really hard pieces. And did you, when you, did you want to dedicate your life to, um, you know, to the calls to the movement of helping, um, you know, victims and, and survivors really um, dealing with trafficking? Th was that what you said when, that's what I'm going to do, I'm going to dedicate my life to it? Or did you just happen to, was it a divine moment like God says, I want you to do this for me? No, it really happened kind of organically. I really fell into the speaking and I realized it was empowering for me to be able to share my story, but not just for shock and awe or at a fundraiser to help someone raise money, but no, like they actually need to hear my story, right? Because if, if we don't come out and if people don't understand, then, then we'll never make any progress. We're going to continue to have hundreds of thousands of, of kids fall into that world, you know, um, uh, all across the globe. And so, uh, for me, like, I, I guess once it kind of started, I, I got my feet wet a little bit. I took a course in public speaking in college and it, it just gave me purpose, you know, for the first time I didn't have that kind of aha God moment. I, I love when God, like how he can give people visions and they can see something like a five or a 10 year vision. 
that that's not how God is with me. And so sometimes it's just the next step, you know, and it's okay. Like, okay, I'm going to go to school. All right. So I can provide for myself and my son. And I, I mean, I wound up switching degrees and I had to learn that it was okay. It was okay to change my mind. It was okay to make mistakes. That was something that I would get beat for previously. And so it was, it was hard, you know, figuring out who I am for the first time at age 30 with, as a mom, you know, like, yeah, that's a lot. um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're so amazing. Uh, it's, it's amazing. And, and so this is where I'll kind of want to really shift the gears and kind of get into our, our prosper 21. Um, you know, mindset, because we're big on entrepreneurship and really helping people take the initiative to empowerment. We're trying not to help people. We're trying to help people not become dependent on, you know, um, the world system and or just, you know, our, our nine to five jobs, which is nothing wrong with those. But I just think God has so much more for us. And the only way that we can do it is if we stretch out. Now, the thing that I loved about, you know, your life and what you're doing is that you represent a a very a different aspect of that because again most people think well if i'm going to you know be an entrepreneur i need to you know start a tech company or i need to you know <laughs> figure out how i'm going to sell my mom's barbecue sauce recipe <laughs> you know whereas you have taken your life and you've used again those really hard pieces to begin to create a future for yourself and to create opportunity for yourself um, by bringing awareness to this cause. And I think a mission-based entrepreneur or even a social entrepreneur, whatever term a person wants to use. And I think that you are onto something so amazing and brilliant. Um, and there are people here in our, in our, you know, in our experience that are, you know, saying, hey, I'm not a, you know, a business magnate. I'm not a Mark Zuckerberg, but I do want to use something of my heart of my life to help people and to be fruitful in that regards how 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 was that journey for you you know um being able to turn your i hate to say your past but it's not really your past but just using your pain and that experience if you had you know in terms of purpose and and really to to begin to be fruitful uh in life how how has that been for you and you know what were some key takeaways that you've had you know, on that journey so I, w I was able to lead Valiant Hearts as their executive director for um, about two and a half years until 2020. And then I, I got an opportunity to go work with a philanthropist. And she had been a friend um, of Valiant Hearts and a donor as well. And um, we just kind of hit it off. And so she had an a position open at her foundation. And so I was able to make that, make that switch and get to really survey the field and I think a lot of times it's about meeting a need, right? It's about finding, solving a problem or meeting a need is usually, I mean, if you can do that, then you most likely have a business, you know? And so at the, working with the philanthropist at the Jensen Project, um, I had an amazing experience. We, we wound up funding $3 million in anti-trafficking organizations with economic empowerment programs and housing programs. And so we had about 55 different organizations apply for over 20 million and we had to whittle it down. She only wanted to give away 2 million at first, but she wound up ultimately awarding 3 million because there's just that many great people doing good work. And so I got the opportunity to look at all those different organizations and what they pitched. And what I saw was that there wasn't, and I kind of realized that there's a, a continuum of economic empowerment. I think at first, when you get out, it's about barrier removal. You know, it's about getting a GED, um, what, uh, any legal issues that you need to solve, um, getting those things out of the way. And then you have kind of like the social entrepreneurship type, which is, you know, the candle making and leather bag making that usually is like a, a profit arm of a nonprofit. And, you know, while that's, very important. It's very important to learn how to have, you know, learn how to be employed, you know, have how to have a healthy relationship with authority. I mean, all those kind of soft skills and to be able to fail in a safe environment um, for survivors. But w what we didn't see very much of was that far into the continuum where we're, we weren't seeing a lot of survivors being launched into truly like living wage, sustainable careers. There was one organization that was actually a winner and they're in California teaching survivors how to code. So they're getting jobs in technology and they offer free childcare. They have school on site. 
And I mean, they, they literally are building apps and websites before they ever even get out of the school. So, I mean, they were launched into a, a very sustainable career. And so that was really the only thing. And so it just, um, it just hit me like, okay, I've, I've got to do something. And so what I'm doing today is I'm actually launching a real estate brokerage to help myself and other survivors get into real estate as a means of economic empowerment, you know, towards economic freedom really is, is what we're looking at. And so, um, I got licensed in real estate earlier this year and had my first, first summer here in Texas as a real estate agent. It, um, and it's, it's a whole new world. Um, and I'm also actually launching a law center in the state of Nevada. Um, I, as I mentioned, er, I think earlier that I sued the state of Nevada to help end legalized prostitution there. And while we haven't been successful with that lawsuit or ending the legalized prostitution yet, but we believe we will, um, we, we realize that we need to um, set up this nonprofit law center to provide pro bono legal services to survivors because there's really not a sex trafficking survivor uh, that has wasn't trafficked through the state of Nevada and didn't you know get arrested at some point and so there there's a, a ton of people that we could be helping and so that's just that's just really my heart I I think you know nonprofit work can get a bad rap sometimes that you know and sometimes it can be low paying jobs for smaller organizations but but what you get I mean they being able to you know be kingdom minded and being able to see transformation happen, being able to help another human being that thought they were worthless, you know, and being being able to see them find their own worth and and become secure, independent people. I mean, that that to me is what it's all about. Like, I mean, that's just that's just my my heart and what I feel like I'm here to do is to, to help other people. That's that's so amazing. Wow. And, and we just pray and. We're believing with you that your efforts and that stronghold, because we know it's, I mean, b beyond the legal things, the Bible tells us that, you know, that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. And we definitely recognize that, you know, that stronghold in Nevada, uh, Las Vegas is, is definitely spiritual. It's definitely demonic. And um, mm -hmm. and so we definitely want to be praying and, you know, not just we're praying, but, you know, uh, waging war on every aspect, spiritual, mm -hmm. um, of course, and then economic, and as you're doing from a legal perspective. So, um, you know, everybody watching, let's get involved, let's get connected, let's help Becca and what she's doing because this is a divine assignment. This is a, she's an agent of kingdom justice and um, it's beautiful and I just love it. And you talked about freedom. I just, I just, it's so much I want to talk to you about it. Like, oh my God, I'm so limited. I just, you know, <laughs> so many angles here. Um, you talked about something. You said earlier today that physical freedom does not equal emotional freedom. Mm -hmm. And then you talked about how now what you're trying to do is help people get economic freedom. So there's this trend of freedom or this, this you know, this aura of freedom that what you're trying to help people do is helping them get physically free, helping them get emotionally free uh, or mentally. And then at the same time, now we're on economic freedom. And, you know, this is needed and and i want to I'm, I'm saying this i'm talking to our our, uh, our people who are with us um because you got to understand that when god gives you an assignment or not even that but when we talk about opportunity and 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 entrepreneurship again becca is using helping people as a means as the basis for her enterprise and this is something that we can't miss you know Again, it's not about big businesses. It's not about all the time big buildings in downtown cities, but being able to build big people and help change people's lives is also a viable business plan. And you got to we got to understand that. And that not only that, but God is going to release favor and grace with us to do that and to be able to move in those directions. So, um, Becca, I, I got to talk to you more about this in these next few moments, our next few fleeting moments. Um, you're starting a real estate brokerage, okay? Um, you know, what what changes what what do you what do you see the difference between people who may be candlestick makers <laughs> compared to your your efforts as going more on the people side, the social side of business? Like what have been some of the differences that you've seen? Because there are people who are watching and say, Okay, well maybe God is calling me to do social based enterprise and you know, is it the same as, you know, commercial or traditional enterprise or what are some differences that you've that you've experienced or barriers that you may have seen? 
I mean, I think it's all about creating opportunities, right? For other people, it's about, um, you know, if when we look at the prison industrial complex, you know, and we look at the mass incarceration, the, the disproportionate incarceration in America, and then we... We look at the opportunities that you have for people, even even just that people that have been incarcerated, like the the lack of opportunities that they have available to them. And so I just implore everybody. I mean, if you have a job, I mean, it, being able to create space and opportunity for other people to excel, like to me that 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 just like because we we look at people and we think like well why did they go back or oh well you know Billy's at it again you know he robbed yeah. someone else. And it's like, well, really, he had no opportunity and choice, you know, because you can't get a job. I mean, you know, even doing community service as a felon is really hard to find where you can do community service. And so I think creating opportunities for people um, and I and I think, you know, learning how to be a safe person yourself. You know, I think, you know, in terms of uh, the differences between like the social entrepreneurship and and corporate is. Um, you know, and I'm kind of, I'm kind of like straddling that that balance now because I'm in a for-profit industry, and now I have a nonprofit, if you will, mindset in this for-profit industry. But I, it's, I'm having to kind of shift my whole paradigm because the way I used to measure success was in human beings' lives, right? And and being able to, how many humans can I help? You know, how many. How, how many women that are receiving services from us have gotten out of a life, right? How, how have we seen their lives change and, and then become empowered that they're launched into whatever career or their next, next phase of life. And, and so I think that's kind of a, a huge difference is, um, you know, your motive, your only motivation being profit at the expense of others, instead of your motivation, not being profit and it only being about, you know, helping other people is it is a huge shift. And it, to me, it's very fulfilling. Um, you know, I'm really glad that I picked the field of real estate to get into because I think I've thus far I've met some really genuine people that really just want to see you be your best and they're willing to help. Now, obviously, that's not everyone, but I was kind of laughing like, man, if I got into like car sales, like that would be rough, right? Like, because they're trying <laughs> yeah. to get over on you all the time. Right. Like, <laughs> you know, um, and, and I know not all car salespeople are, course, have a bad course. rap, but um, <laughs> I'm just glad that I landed in an industry that that it that has kind of that component, that kind of, you know, hey, I want to see you be your best, that we're not actually in competition with each other, that we can actually build each other up. That's awesome. That's awesome. So uh, here's a major key that I think that um, you're mentioning is that, okay, so really – embracing the mindset of of the the forum that you're in um and an inversion of you know quote unquote organizational values um not personal values but organizational going from people profit versus now we're looking at you know the organization or business profit while still maintaining of course your passion for people and the causes to help people so i think that's amazing um to know um now, why is this so groundbreaking? I could, I, I think it's groundbreaking. I think it's amazing what you're doing. And when you said that, I was like, my ears perked up. Like, this is so awesome. What makes this so special um, about what you're doing and the opportunities compared to the opportunities that people have, you know, particularly survivors? Yeah. Um, I mean, honestly, it's, it's dignified employment. Um, it's, it's a career that you can do until you die. I mean, you know, you can... I, even if you get hurt, I mean, you could still work a career in real estate. And so I think it's groundbreaking. And thank you for your kind words. I think it's groundbreaking also because there's just not that many opportunities out there, especially um, people that have been involved in crimes, right, have criminal records. The opportunities out there are usually low paying, you know, um, wage like labor type jobs. And there's not that many careers that you can make out of it. And so to be able to be your own boss in a career in real estate, I think is a really, really easy transition. It's not for everyone. Obviously, you know, you have to be able to manage yourself and your time and you're going to have to be kind of a figure in the community, obviously, to make connections and, you know, be able to help people buy and sell homes. But um, I think I think um, it's fun because, you know, you're, 
I, f I feel like I'm just helping people in a new way, right? Like I'm helping different people in new ways with one of the biggest purchases that they'll ever make in their in their lives. But you know, the other opportunities that we see, like we I mentioned those social entrepreneurship type businesses. I mean, that's great for those soft skills that you need, but what are you gonna do? Get a job making candles or making leather handbags? Like when you get out of that program, like probably not. You know, you're right. not gonna get a job as a seamstress. I mean, maybe some people do, I'm sure, but is that really a you know a career that you know will be able to provide for you and your family? Um, and so I, I think this is um, along with the the organization Annie Cannons that's teaching girls how to code. I think that's a very very sustainable, um, dignified employment that it's not going to be for everyone. But just creating new opportunities so that people have options is that's what my goal is. That's excellent, family what we are you're being privy to is is something and and of course we can say that this is a a woman who was anointed and gifted by god and it's it's obvious um graced by god to really to be a deliverer and uh, uh again uh, an agent of kingdom justice and this is just so beautiful to see and i hope that you all are being inspired to realize that kingdom enterprise and entrepreneurship is not just about give me the money but it's about how can we take righteous ideas and righteous energy and be able to implant that into community into the marketplace into society to bring about uh kingdom results which is that kingdom come that will be done on earth as it is in heaven and here we see becca has just is doing a tremendous um, example and being a pioneer in this um, and and this is my last thing I want you to talk about it because I could say it but it won't be nearly as good you talked about one of the reasons why you wanted to make this shift um, because you know you said it something about of you know just being profitable just based off of your pain and your trauma it was getting old to you or it can get mm -hmm. old because like, oh, yes, I'm a survivor. You know, I've been through this and with all due respect. But I can imagine that just constantly just having to, you know, gear up and go back and relive that. And this is the only way that you can you know, not the only way, but the your primary income provider. Like, talk about that. Like, you know, w what made you cause cause that shift and say it in your words, because it's more powerful than mine. <laughs> Yeah, and so in 2013, I launched Becca Speaks Out, which is my consulting and training platform that gets me across the country in front of law enforcement, social workers, I mean, just the general public. Um, in November, I actually go to speak to 600 kids in Christian high schools in Washington, D.C. So, I, I mean, a variety of audiences. But um, it, it is hard. It's hard reliving your, your the worst days, the worst moments of your life over and over it's really also hard when you have to survive off that. And so, I mean, I, I can and I have, you know, quite for the last multiple years been able to make a living off of speaking. But um, I, I just wanted to create more opportunity because I feel like we don't have that many opportunities as survivors specifically because most of the time we wind up wanting to try to get a, work, a job in nonprofits because that's the only people that will hire us. And so that means that we're constantly around the same trauma. And I learned a long time ago that direct service work wasn't for me. Um, and so even when I was leading Valiant Hearts, you know, I had to I'm, I had to be very conscientious about how much extra trauma I let in. You know, I was I was much I was much um, more effective at leading the business than I would be at one on one direct services with someone. And that's just not what God called me to do. And so I think like you know, being able to create those opportunities, you know, that I, that I keep harping on that, I know, but just creating a, a variety of opportunities for other survivors, because we're not all meant to be speakers. We're not all meant to be authors. And we shouldn't have to, you know, that shouldn't be our only option at getting dignified employment. You know, it doesn't, shouldn't have to be in the field, you know, so that's why I'm branching out into a whole new industry. And honestly, it's terrifying. So I love all your prayers, like I'm much appreciated <laughs> because it is a, it's a whole new world um but i know it's going to be really impactful and powerful absolutely well as we conclude becca tell us how people can reach you and support you and kind of learn what, what you're going what you have going on um you know your handles email websites all that stuff come on this is your commercial 
<laughs> yeah, I'm everything. You can find me at Becca Speaks Out on any social media channel. Um, my name B E K A H is how I spell Becca Speaks Out. Um, my name is Becca Charleston, as you mentioned. I'd love to connect with you guys to stay, if you have feedback or questions. Uh, my my realty group, uh, my brokerage is called E to E Realty Group. So E to E stands for Exploitation to Empowerment. And um, the Law Center in Nevada that we'll be launching, um, we'll, we're working on the website right now. It should all be wrapped up by January. It's going to be called the Charleston Law Center. So that's another way, if you know anyone that needs pro bono legal services in Nevada, um, we'd be happy to help. Well, this has been a tremendous honor, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart. This has been a tremendous honor to experience you and to really to get a window and a glimpse into more of the amazing things that you're doing. I mean, words on websites and, you know, social media graphics don't do it justice. Um, I thank you for taking your time out of your day to be with us, particularly for Prosper 21. And, and you know, and I know that your relationship in Next Level Church, it will be, you know, this is just the beginning. And um, I'm just, yeah, I'm just, I'm speechless. So um, thank you a thousand times. And um, we will definitely be, uh, you won't, you'll be hearing from us. And, um, and I know that these people here who are, you know, interested or may want to support or may want to donate or whatever, um, will definitely be, uh, continuing in touch with you. So thank you again, Becca and everybody okay. stay locked in. Cause we got more today for this conference. Make sure you're taking notes and make sure that you have questions ready because we're going to be doing questions shortly after this. Thanks again. <laughs>